All right. And I'm uh, failing to understand. You can hear me? Yes, absolutely. Okay. okay. Now, here we go then. All right. Uh, Aaron Mop and uh, Aaron Monarch. It's, uh, uh, between brackets, you see the birthplace of the Australian steel industry. And that's uh, going to come, come up uh, later. Um, first of all, where are we? Uh, Iron Knob is located in the middle back ranges of South Australia, South Australia on the air, if I pronounce that correctly, peninsula that's here, this, this part. And it's uh, some 400 kilometers northwest of Adelaide. The uh, yellow pins uh, have nothing to do with this presentation, but uh, these are the marked points of a road trip there, including Tasmania that uh, my wife and I would have undertaken this year if uh, Corona wouldn't have been in the way. So hopefully we can do that in 22. Uh, so this, uh, I went up here and uh, uh, if we zoom in a little closer, then you see here uh, an overview of the mining areas in the middle back ranges. The vertical bar represents an area of some 70 kilometers from north to south. Uh, Iron Knob is on the northern part that's here. And uh, a number of the mines, according to their website at least, is still an exploration, exploitation on by a company called CIMEC. I've never heard of it, but uh, on the internet they have a site and they, uh, they say that they are still uh, operating uh, part, at least parts of the mines. Um, zooming in for, still further, you see a sky view of the whole area. Uh, if you look at the scale in the right down corner, you can estimate the size of this thing. It's about uh, three, three kilometers from west to east and four kilometers from north to south. And uh, nowadays there is a visitor center that's, that's here. Uh, and you can take tours around the area. Uh, Iron Knob is the village that's uh, uh, on the east side. And it looks as if the whole village would fit into the whole of the quarry. Uh, and zooming, zooming even further, you, this must be the. Come on. This must be the. the Largest black hole on the face of the earth, I think. Uh, if you see the buildings on the rim of it here, up here, then uh, you can see how big this, uh, how huge this thing is. Uh, the line meter is about 500 meters. The lowest level is 15 meters above sea level, and the highest point at 276 meters. Uh, and on top of that, a further 76 meters were removed from the top of the original hill. So in total, we talk about uh, uh, almost 350 meters uh, total depth. I once was in Bisbee, Arizona, and that's a huge hole, but I reckon this year is even larger than that. This is an uh, apparently recent photo that I downloaded from Google Earth. Uh, I hope it's not copyrighted, but uh, I, it gives you an idea of the present situation and uh, the sheer side of it, size of it. This is, uh, this is really huge. So, uh, I, I myself, I haven't been there. Uh, uh, so it's, it's really cool that you can talk about a thing, a, a place where you have never been before. But uh, Jacques Fay has, and uh, he gave me this photo. Uh, and the quote is his, uh, his too. Uh, it seems that I remember the more depressing village in Australia. Uh, and this must be the most luxurious motel that you've ever seen. Uh, I don't, I'm not sure how old this photo is, but uh, it's, uh, several years, I think. But it, uh, it looks great. Hmm? Some data to start with, uh, together with some other mining areas in the region, a major source of iron ore was uh, Iron Monarch for more than 100 years. And that's the reason why it's called the, uh, the, 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 the title on the, on the starting page. Uh, until around 1960, from 1915 to 52, it was the sole supplier for steel making in Australia. 
and until now over 150 million tons of high-grade iron were mined. Uh, and according to their site, this CIMEC uh, company says that they still uh, mine for around 10 million tons per year. It, that seems quite uh, unlikely, I think, but well, it's, at least that's what, they, what their site says. Uh, why are in Monarch? Why, do I, why would I like to do this presentation? Uh, it's, it's a bit of history. I, I already had a, an exchange partner in Australia. I have uh, some 30 uh, regular exchange partners all over the world. And John Toma in Australia was the first from Australia. Uh, and incidentally, in 2019, I came across a single specimen. I put a photo on, on Facebook and then I got a com uh, comment on the book. And it's, uh, you'll see the book uh, in a moment. Uh, but in here in Europe, uh, you, could, you could never get it. So I asked John about it, and he found one for me in, in last year. And then after reading it, I must uh, have uh, like a collection. <laughs> I really wanted one. So I asked John again, and uh, in the end, uh, I acquired a collection of about 100, 100 pieces through Peter Elliott from the South Australian Museum. And that's, uh, that's, that's quite something. Um, so the acknowledgement is that the whole collection has been acquired with much appreciated help from both the gentlemen. Uh, it's supposed to be the, the only larger collection in Europe. That's what they say. That's not my, uh, my interpretation, but uh, that's what I heard. Uh, and in any case, all specimens are analyzed and all photos by myself. As you know. um, and the book. That's what it all started with, this one. Um, the, uh, the author is uh, Glenn Francis. Uh, the book is from 2010, and a nice detail. Uh, Peter Elliott was one of the commentators who was mentioned in the book. Uh, Francis is or was from 1939. I really don't know whether or not he's still amongst the living. Uh, worked in the mine from 1959 until his retirement as quarry manager in 1991. And in the course of years, he got more and more fascinated by the minerals and micro minerals in the mine. And he built, built a collection of his own. And luckily, he always let everything be scientifically analyzed. And ultimately, ultimately that led to the book uh, years later. Uh, as far as I know, it's very hard to come by, so I'm, I'm very lucky that I have one. Um, and the minerals uh, in the book, over 180 minerals are mentioned, and according to Mindat, there are 164 valid. There are six type locality minerals, of which I have four, and you'll see them later. Lots of different phosphates. Uh, I have a collection of about 100 pieces, uh, 50 specimens in this presentation and in alphabetical order. So here we go. The first one is, uh, is appetite. Uh, as always, you see the chemical formula as well as the dimensions of the, of the specimen. Uh, appetite is one of the most the widespread minerals in the quarry, it comes in different shapes and forms. And this one is the most common, but it's really flawless. And most of the appetites are fluor appetites or carbonate fluor appetite. This is also appetite. At uh, first glance, I wouldn't have recognized it directly, uh, but on closer look, you see that the uh, hexagonal uh, hexa Hexagonal basic structure is evident. That's uh, what you see right here. It's uh, sharp and very well developed, but a bit unusual. It's a sort of an umbrella form. But it's uh, it's not, not all too common, I think. This is, uh, these are our appetite clusters. Uh, they look a, a bit like, like zeolites, especially like uh, thomsonite that I found often in the volcanic Eiffel in uh, Germany. But of course, that doesn't make any sense here uh, in this environment. Uh, so, appetite is the logical thing if you see things like, like this. Uh, 
the last appetite, uh, the yellow stuff uh, apparently is uh, cellulite, but the crystal is simply too small to see them individually. Uh, according to Francis, it could well be that this is not first generation cellulite, but altered strangite, which means that somehow sodium must have entered the original strangite. Uh, and, but in any case, it seems that the sequence strangite, cellulite, and appetite on top of that was quite common at the location. Then aragonite, uh, although it, aragonite is very abundant in the world wide, as you know, uh, that's not really the case in Iron Monarch. It was found in just three isolated areas. Uh, Francis reports that recovering good undamaged crystals was not an easy task because the aragonites often grew in hearts to handle voids and were susceptible to breaking. So I can only be glad that this one survived it's in its 10, mill 10 millimeter wide cavity. Atacamite is uh, of such high luster that I always have trouble making decent photos of it. In the copper mines of Australia, atacamite is uh, quite common, but in Iron Monarch, it wasn't discovered until 1986. Uh, probably because it was found, unlike in other places, uh, 200 meters below the surface. Uh, crystals were found up to 15 millimeters, mostly in the shape of flattened chisels like this. Uh, in 1996, there was a find of uh, atacamite in another area with the crystals up to even four centimeters, but those were often distorted and uh, impossible to extract without damage. Then Bermanite. Uh, Bermanite was found in Iron Monarch for the first time in 1992, but not analyzed as such until years later. And uh, I myself have found Bermanite in Sitio de Costello mine of uh, Fogosinho in Portugal, but they look quite different from the ones that you see here. And here the individual crystals are much better visible. Uh, although the larger crystal in the upper right of this photo looks hexagonal, but in fact, uh, Bermanite is monoclinic. And, uh, the shiny red brown color is very typical of this, uh, this mineral. And this is a, an eight millimeter part of the larger specimen of about a few centimeters. Then broken type sprays. They look <clears throat> more bluish than green, actually. But I can assure you that it's the real color. And uh, the tiny crystals you see are uh, acicular. And the broken types with this particular coloration you found in association with smithsonite and namibite, namibite bearing rock. Namibite, I hope I pronounced that correctly. Uh, whereas more common, really green broken types were found together with malachite. And uh, that what causes the, these, these visible color differences that I really couldn't tell you. And calcite, uh, calcite and rhodochrosite are closely related, as you know. Uh, it's calcium carbonate versus manganese carbonate. Uh, and here they are very hard to keep apart sometimes, especially in this pointy heavens uh, as that they both take. Uh, to make even things even more complicated, Francis even reports that the calcite is rich with iron and manganese. So when it turns calcite into rhodochrosite, you could ask. Uh, and you see a comparable photo of rhodochrosite later on. Uh, strangely enough, uh, calcite was not a common mineral in Iron Monarch, but uh, restricted to just a few isolated areas. But that was compensated, on the other hand, by regular finds of specimens up to 30 centimeters. It, uh, it's huge. This is, uh, as all was, the specimen that puzzled me most. The label says crandolite, and I know it's analyzed, so I I have to believe that, but I always thought that crandolite consists of six-sided platy crystals, 
But these things are needles and hairs. And so I really believe that this specimen is a crandolite after ladolite, and that's being a pseudomorph. And uh, according to Francis, that could be possible, but a possibility which exists uh, in Iron Monarch at any case. Uh, as I said before, cerulevite crystals are almost always too small to detect them individually. But this pseudomorphism is more than clear. The pointic basic habit of strangite, uh, as, uh, as you can see here, for instance, is uh, clearly visible. Cerulevite was the most abundant material in the northern part of the quarry, but mostly as, uh, as pseudomorphs after strangite, indeed, by the uh, by the introduction of the sodium in the formula into the sodium free strangite. And uh, first generation strang cerulevite was also found, uh, mostly grown on kid wellite, uh, but in other parts of the quarry. And uh, I have a sample of that also, so I'll show you that later. Uh, as you see, these uh, dufrenites are in the cavity, which has the advantage that individual crystals are clearly visible. Uh, more common and mostly larger are globular clusters. I'll show you one of those in uh, a moment. Uh, globular clusters of platy dufrenites uh, up to two millimeters wide. Uh, in Iron Monarch, the dufrenite, uh, dufrenite is common, as you might expect from an iron phosphate, phosphate of this environment. Uh, and it comes from almost white to green uh, and blue to completely black and uh, in a large variety of different habits. Uh, and I think the red stuff in the, red, in the upper corner is probably lepidocrocite, I think. I said uh, this is a good example of such a globular cluster of plated dufrenites. Uh, this one is uh, two five millimeters wide and brown instead of green. So uh, I said uh, different light comes in different uh, colors, uh, different shades. Here we have a problem. Uh, the problem is uh, distinguishing faustite from turquoise. Uh, you'll see a comparison on the next slide. The formula is the same except for the zinc in phosphate, where turquoise has copper. And therefore, here we, are, here we go again. You have to deal with the turquoise phosphate series. Uh, so impossible to, to discern on uh, visual inspection. Sometimes turquoise even is called cuprian phosphate. But uh, that makes me wonder. Uh, but in spite of all that, Francis assures on the basis of powder X-ray analysis and, uh, and EDS that this stuff in some places within Iron Monarch is pure phosphate, and the color is a bit more whitish than the turquoise, on, where the turquoise is more bluish. Uh, and you see that on the, on the next. This is the comparison. Uh, this turquoise is also from Iron Monarch. Uh, Turquoise is even the second most widespread in the whole quarry after appetite. Uh, and most turquoise is much bluer and glassier than this one. But uh, uh, you, could, you could say the more copper, the bluer the stuff gets. But uh, you will understand that it's uh, on site, it's very hard to make, it, to make a good distinction between the two. Then, uh, Real rarity. Francisite uh, is the first of the four uh, type of quality mineral, minerals that I can show you. You understand, of course, that the name is tributed to Glenn Francis. Uh, Francisite is one of just a few bismuth minerals in Iron Monarch, and to my knowledge, the only selenite, which you see in the formula as EO3 is a selenite. Uh, worldwide is utterly rare. Besides, from here, it's only described in just one other place, one of the former mines on the Italian island of Sardinia. There are a few photos, by the way, on Mendel uh, that show that the crystallization of this mineral. But this is the only one that I have. Uh, the Francisite normally occurs in barite cavities.
The second uh, type of cavity mineral is gatehouse site, and uh, it's just as rare. It is described in just two places worldwide, uh, here and in the Anshwaning mines in South Africa. It's named after Dr. Brian Gatehouse, an Australian crystal chemist. Uh, there's another mineral called waterhouse site that looks the same, comes together with gatehouse site, and it's of almost the same chemical composition. So here we go again. This distinction is only possible by chemical analysis. And I have one of those. I'll show you that by the end of this presentation. Here we have another gatehouse site. This sort of is a bit blur, I'm afraid. But it's from the same specimen. And uh, there's a bit of uh, another lighting. So there is some, some color difference. But uh, what you see are these, these brownish uh, bulbs. That's a uh, that's, uh, gatehouse site. And it's uh, the, the, the matrix is a uh, That's I, I didn't think of that myself, but that's what's on the label. So uh, you can see here already the, uh, the, 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 the difficulty in making the difference with, uh, between rhodochrosite and calcite. Then we have well, we have gypsite. This is a, uh, an unclear photo, I know, but this is uh, so uh, so well, so so lustrous and so complex. Uh, you can just see the contours, but uh, gypsite is monoclinic. These uh, platy crystals have a pseudo hexagonal look. Uh, and I'm really amazed that I received this uh, well-developed specimen collection because gypsite was only found once in just one single spot in the northeastern corner of the quarry associated with hematite. So this is a local rarity, not only because of the very limited presence, but also because of the clarity and sharpness of the crystals. Uh, what you see is just five millimeters wide, but the whole specimen is about one and a half centimeter. Uh, and uh, I think I, I, I tried 10 times to make a picture of this thing, but uh, you see how difficult it was. Then, massive hematite was the primary ore mined at Iron Monarch. Uh, good crystals of it came in all sorts and sizes six sided, six sided plating ones, spherical ones, blocky ones, you name it, and of course, in all kinds of irregular shapes. Of which is this, this one is an example. I have a few, few uh, plated ones too, but those are brown and dull. I like the light coloration of this one much more. And that's why I use it here. Uh, Ghost Excite is a member of the Ammonite supergroup uh, and is closely related to Goyazite and Crandallite. Granulite is a CA calcium analog in cosaic site. The Goya site is the strontium SR analog. Uh, Goxaic site appears in different, different habits here. For instance, as tiny white hexagonal plates, which makes the visual distinction with granulite much more complicated. And also, Goxaic site pseudomorphs after fluor appetite have been found. And of course, goyazite doesn't occur here, obviously due to the absence of strontium. <clears throat> Sorry. Jacobsite belongs to the Spinel supergroup. It is uh, isostructural with magnetite, franklinite, hersenite, and indistinguishable on site. This is the specimen that put my interest in Iron Monarch in motion in the first place. Uh, in Iron Monarch, Jacobsite mostly occurred together with Franklinite, and actually, because according to Francis, Jacobsite apparently is rich in zinc, it should be considered to be a mix with Franklinite, because uh, Jacobsite uh, is the uh, manganese uh, variety of spinel, uh, and Franklinite is the zinc variety. I think that this is the most complex chemical formula of today, kitolite. I don't even uh, know how to read it, let alone understand what it means. 
this uh, slightly yellow coating uh, with, uh, with very fine silky crystallization is the most abundant habit of Kepler light here. Uh, it often completely overgrows Dufrenite in, ca in cavities, and uh, sometimes, but just sometimes, it is associated with these honey brown first generation type. Cerelovites that you see here. Uh, so actually, this specimen did not come in practice, but rather an exception. Then we get, we get uh, the Clemenite. Clemenite is also type locality. It was the first mineral in the uh, Iron Monarch that was discovered new to science. Uh, it always appears as fine needle like crystals as it uh, carries the zinc. It makes uh, sense that it's often observed in the vicinity of Franklinite. It's uh, named after Dr. Alfred Clement from the University of Adelaide. Uh, later, Clemenite was also discovered in Kintori Open Cut at Broken Hill in New South Wales, as well in one other place in China. And, uh, that's about it. Then, uh, Lipidocrocite uh, is a polymorph of goethite. goethite. It has a more reddish glare than goethite, and that can be a reason, though not conclusive, of course, for suspecting uh, lepidocrocite instead of goethite. Uh, besides the col color, also the wedge shaped uh, crystal formation gives it away. Uh, and it may be said that good, visual, good visible single crystals, like in this one, uh, are not very abundant. Normally, it, uh, it often they are just, just uh, masses. Uh, without uh, good uh, uh, crystals. And the uh, matrix here is limited. Then meta switzerite is dehydrated switzerite. If you would ever come across specimens labeled switzerite, then it's always wrong because switzerite in air immediately alters to meta switzerite. Uh, this one may count as a very rich uh, specimen in which the radiated crystal groups are typical for this mineral. Uh, I have a lot of those from, uh, from some slags in Germany, uh, but this is one of the best uh, that I have ever seen. Many sites and their strong magnification can be seen as fine hairs and needles. But in, uh, in Iron Monarch, it is, has only been found in spherical form, like this one. Uh, together with uh, Cerulevite, Millicite is a member of the Wardite group. And Wardite comes later. Well, I put uh, this one in the presentation just because I have it, but it's not very attractive, as you can see. I have uh, far better looking Montgomeryites from the tip top mine in South Dakota, for instance. Uh, an Iron Monarch was only found in one small area, in one lens actually, uh, with crystals up to three millimeters, as a well crystallized, pearly, transparent, lath like crystals. And well, it's hard to see here because it's, it's, it's too dirty to, uh, to make a good, uh, good impression of it. But okay, to be, uh, uh, to, to, be uh, to let you show everything I have, I took this one too. This is an uh, analyzed sample of motromite, individual crystals of motromite, from a minute, uh, so very hard to recognize. They get not larger than one or two tenths of a millimeter. Uh, so only, not only here, but in uh, lots of other places too. <clears throat> Motromite is a venidate, so it's not strange that it occurs in nemibite bearing rock, as nemibite is also a venidate. And in the same environment, as you might expect, a lot of disclosite was present. Nemibite, as I said, is a venidate. Uh, in itself, it's, uh, it's relatively scarce. But in Iron Monarch, it has been reported in some quantities, uh, nothing by bearing rock bound to quartz. It was both found as olive green bladed crystals, 
uh, as well as almost black heavier crystals as you can see here. And uh, yeah, well, okay. Nissanite, after a small prospect in uh, California, Iron Monarch was the second location when Nissanite was found. Though at first it was thought to be turquoise that turned out to be erroneous. And this light was only found in the southern corner of the quarry in a quartz graphite zone rich in copper mineralizations. So this thus mesonite was associated with malachite, pseudomalachite, and chrysocolla. Uh, <clears throat> you can hardly call this stuff crystallized, but what can you expect from a clay mineral? Nontronite belongs to the snack type group uh, with minerals like morelonite, saponite, and sulconite, and all minerals with not much uh, visible crystallization. <clears throat> it's a uh, waxy with a fibrous internal structure uh, that's hardly visible at the surface. As you know, uh, pyrolusite is common and comes in a variety of shapes. Needles, blades, feathers, ball shaped, uh, blocky, you name it. But nevertheless, in this iron de deposit environment, it's quite unusual, as stated by Francis, because it requires a lot of manganese and that is not very common practice in an iron deposit. Uh, looking at the habit of the individual crystals, I wouldn't be surprised if this uh, specimen actually is a pseudomorph. Pyrolusite after manganite, uh, and that indeed occurs here often. This uh, is a bit of an enigma to me. Uh, first of all, I had never heard of it before I received it in this collection. Uh, according to Mindot, it does occur in Iron Monarch, and Mindot also refers to Francis' book, but Francis doesn't mention it at all. Uh, there's no description in the book and it's not mentioned in the, on the mineral list in the book also. So uh, on the other hand, it's analyzed and the crystal on the photo is clearly triggered as it should be. So, uh, well, I, I, I accept that it's pure, pure malite from, uh, from Iron Monarch, but uh, it puzzles me a little bit, I must say. The chemical formula of Ramsey Delight is exactly the same as that of pyrolusite. Uh, according to Mindot, uh, Ramsey Delight is the result of inversion by pyrolusite, whatever that means. If anyone understands what is meant by inversion, I'd be happy to learn. Uh, Ramsey Delight was found in just one isolated, isolated spot in the boy. Uh, so this is uh, not very common there. <clears throat> this is the first of three samples of rhodochrosite I've shown. Uh, as I said before, rhodochrosite and calcite in this uh, environment often are hard to tell apart, especially when the rhodochrosite is almost white or colorless like this one. Uh, the one on the next slide is more of a golden color that already makes calcite less and rhodochrosite more plausible. But the crystal shapes are still the same, as you can see on the next slide. Uh, Rhodochrosite in Iron Monarch, by the way, is what you might call a carrier mineral. Most of the rarities were found on the matrix of uh, Rhodochrosite. Uh, you, already, you already saw that for the gatehouse side, and it also goes for some other rarities uh, still to come. This golden road of crocite may count as an attractive habit, but the third one on the next slide is my personal favorite. Well, that's this one. And uh, this is the color that appeals to me most, orange to red, that's how you want them. And uh, this is uh, also quite large specimen. I see which senior is eight millimeters, but the specimen itself is about three centimeters. So it's uh, quite, uh, quite large. Black velvety crusts of radial fibrous crystals, that's uh, Roman Nashite, if I pronounced that correctly, 
Uh, all those stuff like this can be easily confused with other black needles like holodite, pyrolucite, or cryptomelain. Here it apparently is romanechite. Romanechite. Now, Simonite is actually quite rare. Besides that, our monarch is uh, known only from a couple of mines in Michigan. Uh, it's always glassy, can vary in color from colorless to pale pink. Uh, at Iron Monarch, it was found on dog tooth rubicosite, as well on, as on the matrix of house monite, as is this one. And this uh, specimen was photo of the day of Mindat just uh, 10 days ago, on the 29th of August. Uh, in the meantime, I, uh, I made the photo and you, and this is still not very, not, not good enough. Uh, but I wasn't uh, too pleased with the photo of Mendat. So I tried to make a better one, but it's still not 100%. Uh, Shigaite. The best Shigaites are red and fully transparent, but like this one, the crystals can be colorless too, with a yellowish glare. And, uh, they are extremely high lustrous. Took me about 10 attempts to get a relatively, relatively decent photo. Our monarch was the second site where it was found. Uh, the type locality is the Shiga prefecture in Japan. Uh, but without any doubt, however, the best crystals of Shiga are indeed deep red and fully transparent. Uh, you take a look at midnight if you like. Come from the Shwani mines in South Africa. They are really gorgeous. And you see how small these things are. And all, uh, the whole picture is just one millimeter. So the crystals are uh, not, not much larger than one tenth of a millimeter. Strangite was uh, quite common in Iron Monarch, beside, but basically it says colors, like this one. But as you know, it can be pale pink up to purple. Uh, all colors occur here. Uh, as uh, said before, if sodium enters the strangite, it alters into cellulite, and that's often the case. This is a peculiar one. Sussexite is normally skilled, dull, and earthy. And this one is by far the best specimen of sussexite that you will find on the internet. Uh, worldwide, uh, Sussexite is not too rare, but at Iron Monarch it was extremely rare, let alone in good crystals as these. Uh, it was restricted to just two or three truckloads of Sussexite containing material in the whole quarry, so says Francis. It sits on Hausmanite together with Pink Simonite. Triploidite uh, occurs in spherical clusters and sheaves in color from off white to pale pink and yellow orange brown, together with metasweatserite and here always on calcite. Uh, Triploidite as a mineral is common throughout the world, but mostly it shows no visible crystals. So good crystals are rare, this is this, so this is a good one. Variskite forms a series with uh, strangites from uh, FEPO4 uh, to ALPO4, Variskite. So uh, iron phosphate and aluminum phosphate, uh, Variskite and aluminum phosphate. Basically, it's colorless, um, just as uh, strangite, but it can take fabulous other colorations due to inclusions. The pink to deep red varieties are sort of iconic to Iron Monarch. Uh, they contain up to 10% iron oxides, uh, and hence the, the color. I have a few. So take a look. The next one is gorgeous. This, uh, these are fabulous. They are sometimes called furry and sky, but there's not an approved name. And the red is iron. Raspberry red, and it called us. And the last of the various cards is this. 
this is a beauty. It was a photo of the day on Mendel uh, on the 5th of June this year. And uh, I think I, I published it on Facebook and uh, got over 2,000 likes. Well, here we have uh, colorless, blocky, and transparent crystals, and that is wardite. It forms masses of small crystals like these. Uh, what you see is just two millimeters wide, so you can imagine how small these things are. But uh, the whole specimen is about uh, one and a half centimeters, and it's uh, scattered with dozens of crystals. Uh, due to hematite inclusion, sometimes it can be a bit pinkish. Um, and uh, at Iron Monarch, it's uh, quite abundant. And the accompanying white spheres that you see here are millisite. The last uh, type of calorie mineral is water arsite. It has never ever been found elsewhere, so it's a super rare. And even in Iron Monarch, it's extremely rare, as it was found in just two bowls. And uh, that's it. In fact, it's, uh, it's accompanied by a gatehouse site that looks the same, makes things uh, extra complicated. It is named after Frederick George Waterhouse, and he was the first uh, director of the South Australian Medieval. Yeah. The last, but uh, definitely not the least, is Wavalite. Uh, water clear, long, skinny, great individual cl uh, crystals with high luster. The crystals could reach a very respectable length of one centimeter on a sample of 10 centimeters. So uh, the Wavalite can be colored. There was a minority at Iron Monarch. Uh, and in some areas, uh, as I said before, it was uh, pseudomorphed by granulite. And that uh, concludes the presentation for today. But as finally as we speak, a collection of 360 pieces from Broken Hill and other Australian locations is on its way, also uh, with the help from uh, Peter Elliott. So maybe a future presentation will come up. Thanks a lot. Wait, wait. Am I, can you still hear me? Uh, yes. Um, yeah. Just, just need to stop yes. sharing. I was ready. I think. Yeah. yeah. So this, this was the last slide. <laughs> uh. <laughs> okay. It's the same always. Well, yeah. thank you. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Very good. That was great. <laughs> Yeah, I've never seen so Very many good. minerals that I've never heard of. That's brilliant. Yeah, no. <laughs> Real eye out. That was uh, the first uh, the first reason why I wanted to have a collection. Yeah. The first reason why I wanted to have a collection from there was that uh, in, in the book there were photos uh, of uh, a lot of things that I had never heard of before. Uh, and that was the reason yeah. why I wanted uh, a collection from there. Excellent. I think you You've not only got probably the largest collection of iron mon minerals in Europe, Hank, you've probably got a larger collection than most. Sure, I've got a Frank Lyman, you know, there's a mayor somewhere, but I think it was to stuff on me once. But... Yeah, that's, uh, Peter Ali told me that this, was, this, this well, must be the... Point. Sorry? Uh, we've got somebody talking in the background, sorry, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. I can't see who it is. All right, go on, Hank. Yeah, well, I, I love it. Uh, it's a great collection. And uh, I hope that uh, the things that are on its way will be of the same quality. Well, two weeks' time, you'll get a bit of a, a view of some of the ones you might get from Peter. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm in Italy then, but I'll try to, uh, to, to make uh, contact. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah, I think. Um, Coming up with Broken Hill, there's 350 plus species that have been recorded. Yeah, um, I've got nearly 50% of, of those, so a uh, wow. significant number. Wow. It's a large number, no. 
Uh, as I said, uh, the number of, uh, of, of described in the book described the uh, number of minerals is 180. And there are still a lot more things I've never heard of. Uh, but I, I think that those are virtually impossible to come by, I'm afraid. Uh, I know that there is a collection at the uh, South Australian Museum, and I made an appointment with uh, John Toma uh, that I, uh, when next year, when we uh, will take this trip that I told him about, and we'll go one day with him to the South Australian Museum. And uh, that's one of the things I'm looking very much forward to, because uh, that must be uh, a, 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 well, uh, a very, very, very good collection from there, I hope. Um, and in terms of Glenn, I think Glenn is still around at the moment, but he's he's been sick for quite a while. So, uh, sorry, Glenn Glenn Francis, he's still around. Okay, yeah, I didn't know that. Um, yeah, but he's been sick for for some time. So, uh, yeah, so I, was, I was talking about I was talking to Barry Schubert a couple of weeks ago, and yeah, he's definitely not very well at all. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't understand that. Uh, that's that's San from South Australia. He said he's, he was talking to Barry Schubert, who used to work, collect with okay. Glenn, and apparently um, uh, Barry was saying Glenn is not very well. Yeah, well, he's over 80, so yeah. I can imagine that uh, we're getting old, like, slowly, slowly but surely. Huh? For people that have collected at Iron Knob, are the, are the, mineral specimens that Hank have unusually photogenic or is it common to find really good micros from there? Um, I think the only reason is uh, that, that these have come to light is because of the work that people like Glenn did because he was on the ground all of the time because you can see the size from Hank's description that the size is very of the tiny. Um, yeah. It's a massive amount of material and these only occur in very small cavities. So yeah. there'd be a lot of stuff that would have gone through and, the crashes. And uh, as I said, uh, some of, a lot of the, the, the rarities are just occurred on, uh, on, on very isolated spots in the quarry. So uh, you can find them is, 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 is lucky. Uh, and then find good crystals is even more lucky. Uh, and it's... Uh, you can just to thank uh, Glenn Francis for, for his, his uh, never-ending uh, attempts to, 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 to scientifically uh, analyze everything. Yeah, exactly. So that's the one, one and only reason why we have the knowledge from there that we have now, and the specimens. Mm -hmm. uh, I've, I've, been I've been collecting since uh, late 1980s, and I know in the early days, uh, there was a, a fair amount of um, iron monarch material around at some of the local shows, um, but it was usually restricted to maybe half a dozen species like kidwellite and stringite and yeah, sure. cerulevite and whatever, and waverlite, um, and the red varicites, um, of which I've got probably a lot more than I need. <laughs> Um, I've got a box of them that I got from uh, from a friend of mine uh, a number of years ago. And I use them as, as trade material myself, but um, to get the rarer ones, as Hank says, that they're just so hard to come by. I think uh, you've got probably a few of the species that I don't have as well, Hank, of the rare ones. Um, okay, not for sure. I, I probably have a couple you don't have too. So <laughs> yeah, sure, <laughs> of course. Well, uh, that's, uh, all these stories make, make my collection uh, even more special. Uh, because uh, indeed there are uh, things that nobody has, yep. as far as I know. No. Well, I know I had to go to Mindat to verify that a specimen that claimed to be from Knob Hill on our giveaway tables, which was yeah. red, was actually varicite because I'd never seen yeah. red varicite oh, before. Yeah. Well, and you were lucky too. Well, I was very lucky. <laughs> <laughs> I think everybody thought this is wrong, <laughs> so they didn't bother picking it up. Yeah. If I remember correctly, there is some from uh, Brazil as well. Yes, yeah, correct. Yeah. Yeah, but I correct. don't think that's very in um, Jim. I think it's a different element that uh, that causes the coloration in that one. 
Oh. I think from memory, I'll have to check that out. All right, um, do we have any other questions for Hank? No. no? Everybody's stunned. <laughs> Kathy has. Yeah, yeah, brilliant. Ah, uh, Kathy, sorry. Uh, Kathy's frozen, so I don't know that Kathy's yeah. going to... Hank, hi. This is... Hi, Hank. Yeah, can you hear me? Hi, hi Hank. Um, yeah, from I'm Washington, D.C. on a micromounter. Are you... Yeah, oh, are you... Are you strictly a micromounter? And my second question is, how do you succeed with the beautiful photography? Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> I started uh, 30 years ago, over 30 years ago, collecting everything that I could lay my hands on. And uh, it has shifted from larger specimens to micromounting for, mm -hmm. let's say, the last 15 years or so. And, uh, actually, uh, I had a collection of about 800 uh, hand pieces. Uh, and uh, just a uh, half year ago, I changed them. I didn't sell them. I changed them. I exchanged them for uh, 6,000 micros. But I'm still working on now, and it's going to take me another few years before I have to, I have to work at that all out. Uh, but uh, until, so, until now, I'm very satisfied with that exchange because uh, those, those larger things were just uh, standing around in uh, some showcases. But uh, these uh, micro mounting is, is hard work every day. Uh, that's what I love about it. And making, making photos is uh, something I do, I've been doing for, let's say, the last two, two or three years. Uh, yeah, well, I hope that you get better at it uh, with more experience, uh, more insight, more tries, uh, more failures, etc. Uh, and I, I try to improve myself every day, uh, together with Chuck Faye, by the way, because I learned it from him uh, a, few, a couple of years ago. Uh, we meet every week and uh, we always uh, say to each other that oh, we just have to get better. <laughs> and so, yeah, well, I love doing it. Yeah. Right. If you want to know how, if you want to know how, that takes another lecture, I'm afraid. Because I it, can uh, answer. If, you, if you like, I can show you one of these occasions, uh, how, how I work, what I do. Sure, so one day. Uh, I, know, I actually that. liked your hematite crystal, the hexagonal crystals of hematite. I've never seen hematite in crystal form. Great job. Okay. So there's plenty of um, crystals of hematite in Australia. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. A lot of it gets yes. supported. But... <laughs> yes. All right. Uh, any other questions for Hank? If not, we'll finish up for today and see you all back okay. in two weeks, staying in Australia, uh, this time for Broken Hill. Right. So. Well, it was a, a pleasure as always, so thanks for listening. Thank you, Hank. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Hank. All right. Goodbye, everybody. Well, Bye-bye. Bye-bye.